Well, oh, good morning, Cisco cohort. It's uh, nine o'clock, and I'm uh, out, of, out of respect for everybody's time. I'm going to go ahead and start pretty much on time today. So today is the first uh, first day of the uh, uh, capstone CCNA four course, so-called CCNA four course. It was reorganized last February. <clears throat> There's only three courses now, but uh, in education we moved glacially, so we still have it aligned to this course number. We'll eventually get new course numbers in the next spring or next fall. Uh, so today I'm going to cover the uh, uh, my TCC organization for this course. We'll look at the instructor class requirements or what you know, what uh, you thought probably think of as really a syllabus, and then we'll look at the Cisco Network and Academy side because these new courses, uh, finding the online ebook is not quite as obvious as it used to be. Uh, then I'll cover the Chapter One, Chapter Two OSPF, and I'll show you the PowerPoint file, the integrated PowerPoint file I'm going to use today. I've also posted the two official ones for that. Check, check, we, okay, good, good, we're getting set. Um, and then Thursday, we'll have our first lab, in-person lab, in the, in the business building, SBUS 1125. And you have the option, if you don't ever wanna come to any or all, or any A uh, of the lab courses, uh, you can complete the uh, labs using the Cisco packet tracer software and send me your Microsoft Word file for that. Okay, so let's see. First of all, I'll stop. We're going to look at the MyTCC first. So I'll stop sharing this. And I'll bring the MyTCC up so we can see that. Okay, good. So we can see, we can see now the MyTCC. This is a, I'm logged on this instructor, but I've clicked a button that makes it look like what it looks like to the students, the student preview mode. So it looks kind of like this for you. So whenever you log on to MyTCC Blackboard and click on this class, uh, you'll get uh, this announcement screen first. So this is just the same, same thing I emailed to you guys, which is uh, the classes will be Tuesdays at 9 a.m. remotely online using the Collaborate program we're all on now. And I'll record all lectures and post them later for later review. That will appear in the recorded presentations link. It's over on the so waggle, waggle, does it show? The recorded presentations link. We're, right now we're in the Blackboard Collaborate link. <clears throat> so our Thursday, 9 a.m., just like we did, you guys that were still with us from last time, uh, with the same exact structure, the online uh, death by PowerPoint uh, lecture online sessions will be through Blackboard Collaborate, our Zoom-like software. And then Thursdays, we'll have our in-person labs if you want to come to the in-person lab. And I normally, at the beginning of every Thursday, I go through a walkthrough demonstration on the actual real equipment, uh, not using Packet Tracer, but using the actual real Cisco equipment we have in the lab. I'll sort of walk through and do a medium to maybe just brief interview, uh, uh, overview of how that lab works. And those are recorded and posted online for later review as well. Okay, so looking at our TCC, my TCC Blackboard, first of all, we see announcements. So let's look at the syllabus. And this is probably going to, let's see if this is going to work without blasting the screen away. Oh, good, it's working. You can see this. Okay, so me, yeah, me, I'm Hicks. I'm your humble instructor. Um, if you need to email me, there's the email address up there. Uh, this is an eight week class. We're very liberal about our drop dates. So you can drop the class up till December the 3rd, which is like the day before the final starts. So here are my posted office hours. Now, there's a bunch of stuff here that I'm not going to read to you. That's what the educationists require us to put on here. Um, so this is a, a Cisco Network and Academy. I've been teaching this Cisco Academy for over 20 years now. This is the world's single largest, most successful, single most successful e-learning initiative, free e-books. We've been on the free e-book thing for 20 years now. We're way ahead of the rest of of uh, education here in career, tech career technical education. So you're gonna get free online access to all these Cisco courses you've ever taken forever. So far it's been forever. It started in, in the late 90s and so far every single one of the seven to 10 main students that have gone through the Cisco Networking Academy still have free access to these free eBooks. So um, you've all been given access to the Cisco Networking Academy website at netacad.com. We're gonna look at that in a minute. Uh, this is what we'll use online for seeing the free ebook and for taking the, the so called module exams. They used to be called chapter exams. Now they're called module exams. Uh, 
Uh, this is the last course, the capstone course, Enterprise Networking, Security, and Automation, or INSA. In February 2020, CCNA revised some of their objectives. So uh, uh, we're going to sum up here. We're going to look today, for example, at OSPF, Open Shortest Path First, a routing protocol. And we'll look at some other things through the course, course of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the eight weeks that we'll be here together. So now that we've gone to this uh, uh, virus theater business, um, uh, you can't come to all the lectures. You only are uh, given the option to come to the laboratories on Thursdays. So uh, I have to keep attendance records whether you come or not because we get tax money from Austin. We get about $60 million from Austin every year. Uh, since everything's recorded and you can come later in an asynchronous mode if you want to, uh, it doesn't hurt you any uh, if you come if you want to come to a regular a recorded session in a synchronous mode rather than attend these uh, sync sessions that are happening here. Um, the skills lab assessment that we used to have uh, is off the books right now um, because it requires too much up close and personal stuff working in a group, and so we're not going to have that right now. So the grade is going to be based upon you guys that were in here last time, same thing as it was last time. Uh, I'm going to take the module exams and the final chat, the final exam for the course, and just add them up and average them, and that'll be 50% of your grade. The other 50% of your grade will be all the laboratories in this course. Uh, there's five, six, seven laboratories we'll do in this course. One or two I'm going to do as a demo. Uh, you won't have to do them. I do drop the lowest lab grade. So if you're a lab short and we're coming to the last week of class, I drop the lowest lab grade that won't hurt your grade. Uh, I use IRS 5.4 rounding. If you owe the IRS, uh, if you have a refund coming from the IRS for $89.50, they don't like the cents, they'll round it up and they'll send you, they'll send you $90. So if your average at the end of the course is 89.5, I'll round it up to 90, you'll get an A. We don't give minuses and pluses here, just A, B, Cs, and so forth. Okay, we saw this part here. We're going to be Tuesdays. It'll be like we're doing today. And on today's schedule, we have OSPF, the theory and operation of OSPF. And after I cover that uh, lecture, uh, uh, the slide presentation, slide deck stuff, I'm going to bring up the packet tracer on the screen and give a little brief demo of how to configure OSPF on a couple of machines in a similar setup to what we'll see on this lab 2.7.2 uh, that we'll do on, on next, uh, next Thursday. Now, most people seem to have no problem completing these labs in, oh, an hour or two, starting at 9 o'clock. Uh, the class to, uh, can last till uh, like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I have a department advisory meeting that starts at 1230, so if you're still around working on your lab, you're welcome to stay in the room till 1 or 110 or so. But starting at 1230 on Thursday, I'm going to be keying, in, keying into a, a, a advisory meeting for the department. This is where we have our people from outside industry come in and tell, tell us what should we be teaching as a department here? So that shouldn't be a problem for any of you guys. Okay, so um, Thanksgiving week. Thanksgiving week. Um, no week the whole week. No classes the whole week. No lecture on Tuesday. No class on Thursday. Thursday will be Thanksgiving. We're kind of going in line here with the public schools now. It seems like lately, you know, when I was a kid, you got out for Thanksgiving, you know, Wednesday afternoon before Thanksgiving. Uh, but these days they're giving the kids the whole week off. So we're doing that now too. The final examination, the last week of the course, will be on. We, we've been asked to leave these final exams on for a week, to give everybody a chance to come whenever they're ready, whenever a time is convenient for them, that they can come in and take these final exams. So I'm going to turn on the final exam at 9 a.m. Wednesday, December the 9th. It will be available for a slightly over a week for the following Wednesday at 5 p.m. on December the 16th. And that time, 5 p.m. December, Wednesday the 16th, will be the final deadline for all work to be turned in. So I've got a dean who was in the Marines for 30 years. He don't take no guff. I got to turn in my grades by that date. Okay. And there's some additional stuff at the bottom here about how we do the grading scheme and so forth. So that's enough of this stuff. Let's go back to, let's see. Um, I click this? Will I click this? Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay, so we looked at the announcements. We looked at the syllabus. Um, Blackboard nonsense. A word about Blackboard. Blackboard is a really, it's, uh, it's kind of like, it, it's barely adequate. 
we have to do things like put in bigger numbers and the grade totals than what actually ha happened here. So you'll see some numbers. You'll say, well, you know, I did those labs and I didn't get the whole 37 points or whatever. You have to put bigger numbers in there. You're still going to get properly graded. You're going to get up to 50 points for your chapter test in the final. You're still going to get up to 50 points for your labs. Even if you miss one lab, you can still get the whole 50 points. So pay no attention to this bogus nonsense you see in Blackboard. Same thing with Cisco Network and Academy. Uh, the averages at Academy are not meaningful. Uh, around the last week of class, I will key everything into Blackboard and you will see what your final grade is going to be. My strategy in this class is try to get a 90 or above on all the module exams. Uh, final exams typically a little bit harder. Uh, if you do miss one module exam, I can take whatever you make on the final exam and substitute that if you miss one module exam. So if you do that, you're pretty sure to get at least an A and surely a B in the course. If you come and do all the labs and make your best effort to try to get a 90 or above on all those chapter exams. The course evaluation is the web advisor course evaluation. That's not required by us particularly. We used to chase, when we came in person, we used to come in and chase this teacher out of the room and ask you to do that. Uh, you don't have to do that. That's a, that's a, that's a student satisfaction survey form. It's, it's um, it's anonymized. I can't see anybody's individual stuff. I can't even see it until after the exams are turned in, final exams are turned in. However, on the Cisco Networking Academy, there is a thing that's another student satisfaction survey called course feedback. And you do have to take that before you take the final exam. Otherwise, you can't take the final exam. That's a Cisco business rule. That's anonymized. I can't see anybody's individual response. So, guys, this is your one chance to comment on my choice of bath soap and say anything you want to about me and how you think this courses are preparing you to go out in the workplace. Okay, the course presentation materials, these are the death by PowerPoints. So here's the, the, the first two here, are the official ones covering OSPF. Uh, I'm gonna use the third one. That's, uh, I think it's got better graphics, covers everything in my presentation. I've got extra one down here that's got cool graphics. If you if you wanna enable those dangerous macros on your Microsoft Word, you can see some cool graphics about how the two routers established an adjacency with each other. But I'm going to cover uh, this one here. This covers all the stuff that's in the session. Uh, just glancing over the attendance here. I have to keep attendance. Okay, uh, student lab printouts. I've got a couple of presentations up here. Uh, if you need to find out how to install Packet Tracer on your Windows machine or on Macintosh, there are some uh, YouTube uh, videos on how to do this. You can also get Packet Tracer on Linux, and you can even get it on, uh, what do you call it? Um, not iOS, um, uh, uh, what's that other operating system for the telephone called? Uh, the one that's not the Apple phones, uh, you can get it on that as well. Uh, but it works better if you have a full screen, full screen desktop or a laptop computer. The lab we're gonna do on Thursdays is 2.7.2, and after I cover the, the uh, lecture today, the slide deck, I will go through and bring up Packet Tracer here, and show a little bit about how that works, uh, how you get the routing protocols to share their routing information with the other routers that are present there. There are some study guides here um, for some of the stuff that we've covered here. There's a few options here that are no longer, oh, point to point protocol is no longer in there, uh, but these are Microsoft Word documents that you can just read on your own time and help, help to study for the, uh, for the CCNA test. The recorded presentations is where I will put the, uh, uh, this is where I will put the videos, the recorded presentations for the Tuesday lectures and the Thursday recorded presentations on the walkthrough for the lab. So they'll be posted there as the, as in descending order as it goes down as the, as we go on there. Okay, so we covered everything on that. So let's see now. Um, Covered the MyTCC, I've covered the syllabus. Now we need to look at the Cisco Network and Academy website right now. Okay, so let me see. I'm going to, let's see, let me unshare this for a second. And uh, let's, uh, allow me a second here to log into the Cisco Network and Academy site. And then I should be able to reshare this. So let's see, a share application screen. 
and share application and share share the Medicaid. Okay, so here we are in our courses. I'm teaching the introduction networking course on Mondays and Wednesdays, and then on Tuesdays and Thursdays. You guys, some of you guys were with me when they finished the what we used to call the uh, uh, Cisco three. Now we're in Cisco four. Uh, as soon as we renum renumber in the in the spring or next fall, it'll go down to three courses, and they're going to have a new the one that's going to be replaced by a new what I call baby baby Cisco course instead of an introduction to introduction, or as Dilbert says, a pre planning planning meeting meeting. So we're here in the ENSA here, and I'm going to launch this course. Okay, and let's look at the left-hand column here. So if you click on My Netacad, it'll take you back to that screen that shows you all the Cisco courses that you're not taking right now. Uh, their old ones are still available. They, they just drop off. You can pull them back up again. You can previous Cisco courses. Um, the modules is, this is where we can see, there used to be a thing to click where you would launch the uh, ebook. Well, now to do this, you have to go down and click on this course content, click on this. And then click on this button here, and that will actually launch the ebook. It'll actually open a new browser window to do that. I'm going to go back to modules. The modules is also where you can see there's two places you can take the exams. They're here in the modules. If you want to take an exam, you can click on the module exams we have, have here instead of all the separate chapter exams we have. We won't be using any of the online skill exams. The course feedback form, yeah, you need to take the course feedback form before the final exam. I will turn a practice final on for the end of the course, but that doesn't count whether you take it or not. And then the real final exam, uh, see it says prerequisites, you must take the course feedback first before you can take that final exam. And there's a CCNA practice certification exam too that will be available for you then. Okay, so these are also available in the assignments tab. If you go to the assignments tab, you can see, well, here's the first test we're going to have on chapters one and two that I'll cover today. And I think I've already got that test turned on. And then when you click on the grades, that's the bring up the page where you can show how, you know, how what grade did you make on these various exams that were present there. Now, this stuff over on the right, pay no attention to this bogus nonsense about what your average grade is for the course. The Cisco Network County website has no knowledge of your in-person or packet tracer labs you turn into me. Uh, Blackboard has no knowledge of your Cisco Network and Academy grades, chapter grades, modular grades, and they won't until the, toward the last week when I bring them all together. You're required to use Blackboard to calculate your final grade. So in the last week of class or so, you'll see that pop up on your Blackboard. You can see your actual uh, numeric grade appear there. So I think I've covered everything I need to do in the, in the Network and Academy here. So let me stop sharing that and go back to put it on the attendance and let's see who's, oh, we got a couple of new guys that showed up here. Stand by while I mark them down. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Who am I missing here? Uh, oh, there he is. Okay, let me see now. What am I doing now? I'm gonna. Okay, I covered Network Academy. I covered the the TCC, my CTC Blackboard. Oh, it's time for Death by PowerPoint. Okay, so let's do that. So let's see if I go back and share files and share this PowerPoint. I got to click on it first. And oh, there was a question up on the screen about. Um, how to connect on Network Academy. Um, you were sent an invitation in your MyTCC email with a, click, a link to click on to connect to the Network and Academy. Now, let's see, one of you has put a question how to connect on Netacad. Um, maybe check your spam folder, but go, when you go to MyTCC Blackboard on the left-hand lot side, there's a link to get to your official student email, MyTCC email. And there'll be an email in there. Uh, if you don't see it, you have trouble getting in there, uh, send me an email and I will click on the Network Academy to send you an additional 
invitation. Now, it's my recollection that pretty much everybody was in here. Let me just check one second here and see if the person that said, uh, said this message is the one that was having trouble getting in yet. Hang loose. I'm looking on the official Cisco Networking Academy. You guys are going to continue to see the first page of the slide. I'm going to check on my student uh, uh, teacher thing to make sure I can see who and students have last logged in. So let's see. I'm going to click on course details. And oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, so uh, Cyril, thank you. You have never clicked on that link in your email. Everybody else has. Um, uh, uh, look your email, look at your MyTCC email, and you'll see that invitation. Uh, shoot me an email if you've lost it or don't have it in there. And I'll, as a matter of fact, I'll do it now. I'm going to go click on you right now and send you an additional invite. And uh, uh, it'll show up right at the top of your email there. So when you click on that, uh, you'll get to go to the Network and Academy site, decide what your password's going to be, decide if you like the way your name is spelled, and things of that nature. And uh, Swear to God, they're over 13 years old. This is United States law about websites, and then you should be able to access to that. If you have any problems, just send me that. So in the interest of time, let's go ahead and continue with this. Okay, so let's see. Share files. I am sharing. I am sharing. I'm now sharing. There we go. Okay, open shortest path first. The open means it's an open standard. Think of Linux, uh, Microsoft is proprietary commercial software. Oh, Microsoft, I found a problem with, with the Microsoft Windows product. Uh, there's 60 million lines of code. Uh, send me the source code and I'll see if I can fix it for you. I'm an expert programmer, you know. Oh yeah, all these uh, thousands of professional programmers at Microsoft uh, can't turn out a, a Windows product that doesn't have bugs in it. It's actually physically impossible. Once you get over about 10,000 lines of code, not have bugs. You fix a bug and four more crop up. I can't blame them for that. On the other hand, a bunch of ragtag programmers from all around the world have created this Linux operating system for free, and it's clearly superior to Windows. So uh, Linux is an open source product. Uh, free is in speech and free is in beer. An alternative to uh, to uh, uh, Microsoft Windows if you want to use a free product. Any of you uh, A plus guys, have you uh, booted and dual booted, uh, dual installed Linux on your Microsoft Windows machine? Okay, so this chart shows, uh, um, back from our fundamentals of networking, we talked about interior gateway protocols. These are protocols that an organization like the Tarrant County District, Tarrant, Tarrant County College District. We, we own our own buildings and computer networking equipment, and we decide what we get to run within our own company as what computer protocols we're going to use, what equipment we're going to buy, and so forth. So we had this some sort of sweetheart hardware deal with Dell where, all our hardware is Dell computers. Before that, it was Hewlett Packard. Before that, it was, I don't know, it was a candy or something like this. So we could decide uh, what kind of networking equipment we're going to buy. Now, most companies that use particular types of networking equipment lock into one vendor, mainly because they can get a bigger package deal from the value-added resellers that sell them the equipment if they buy all equipment from that one company. So we're a Cisco shop. We use all Cisco routers and switches. We can get a better deal for the taxpayers because we can get a bigger discount by going to our value-added reseller and buying all a bunch instead of buying, you know, half from vendor A, half from vendor B, half from vendor C, things of that nature. So interior gateway routing protocols are those protocols we use within our company, and we're going to choose one. We used to use EIGRP as our interior routing protocol. Now we use OSPF. We switched, I don't know, about 10 years ago. EIGRP is a proprietary to Cisco. Only runs on Cisco stuff. RIP is open standard. OSPF is open standard. Everybody that makes routers supports RIP and OSPF. They're open standards. So uh, we're going to look at OSPF version 2, which is uh, V2 means it's for IP version 4. Uh, the 32 bit dotted decimal addresses like 192.168.1.1. Uh, OSPF version 3 is no longer a CCNA requirement, so we won't have to worry about routing IP version 6 stuff. With OSPF version 3, you know, those like 2001 DBA FE80 
type addresses you see with the colons instead of the uh, dotted decimal stuff. IP version 6 is 128-bit addresses. The old IP version 4 is just 32-bit addresses. So OSPF is a link state routing protocol, which means that the routers all share a little piece of a jigsaw puzzle with each other as to their own each individual knowledge of their corner of the network. And all together, then these puzzle pieces, this jigsaw puzzle pieces put together by each and every router. And so each and every router has a complete roadmap of where they are in the whole network topology. Kind of similar to the sense that your jet navigation unit, when you drive around, it's got the complete roadmap of the whole Dallas-Fort Worth, Denton area. Okay, no matter where he is, he's got that whole map of it. So OSPF, we have a whole map. Everybody's got the complete topology map of the entire network. A distance vector routing protocols, they don't have the complete map. They sort of a how hazy, my neighbor told me this type of thing. The IGRP, even though it's very sophisticated, it's really only a distance vector routing protocol. The original RIP uh, only had what his neighbor told him. Oh, uh, I think I, I know about this server, and it's two hops away in the building, and if you just send it to me, I'll try to send it to him. So OSPF is more, is more sophisticated in that regard. Now, exterior gateway protocols are not used by individuals or corporations. They're used by service providers like ISPs. So this is what forms the Internet. They all connect together with order gateway protocol version 4, and all the ISPs know how to connect to each other. So OSPF is what is classless? Well, classless means, let's take a look at the old RIP protocol. It was a classful protocol. That means that when the RIP router sent the network information to its neighbor, they only sent the network prefix, but not the subnet mask. So therefore, in RIP, you have to use the same subnet mask everywhere, or it won't work properly. They fixed that in RIP version 2. They fixed it so that it sent the network prefix and the subnet mask. So a classful networking ended in 1995, okay? We want to go classless because it allows us to, to pick our precious IP4 address that we have and not waste so many of them when we do our subnetting. So OSPF is classless. That means we can use any subnet map. If we want a point-to-point -point link between two corporate locations, we can use a little slash 30 network that only has two addresses. We won't waste a whole slash 24, which would have 250 addresses. It's link state, which means each router has got the complete roadmap of the entire network in them, although we can divide it into areas to ease that uh, processing burden on all the routers. So it scales up very well. So the, the, the request for comment RFC for OSPF says it's only metric. Now, remember, uh, RIP was hop count, only hop count. ERGRP was a bandwidth, a delay, sort of a composite metric. But OSPF, they said, they said it's only cost. It didn't say what it cost should be, but obviously God intended the cost to be bandwidth. So Cisco iOS software uses bandwidth. The faster the bandwidth, the lower the cost, because I would rather send my data over the fast bandwidth link, like a fiber optic 10 gigabit ethernet link will be faster than a dial-up haze mode and 56 kilobit link. So Cisco routers automatically calculate this, this cost metric using bandwidth so that your data goes the fastest way possible. If we have multiple links for redundancy and the fast link dies, well, we'll use the slow link uh, because fast link's not available anymore. <clears throat> so OSPF was developed from starting about 1987 and uh, became available in the 90s. And then toward the end of the 90s, when we started seeing this push for IP version 6, IP next generation is what it was originally called, they developed the version for IP version 6. Uh, you'll get IP version 6 now in the CCMP uh, routing scheme. So here is a OSPF message that's been encapsulated in Ethernet frame. So there's a data link frame header, you know, the Ethernet address, source address of the device that's sending it, probably a, a, a router's Ethernet port. The destination address is a special multicast address that's reserved for OSPF. Inside of that Ethernet frame is a, is a IP version 4 packet, with the sending address is the IP address. 1.2.3.4, whatever the address is, of that interface. And IP uh, OSPF uses a special multicast address of 224.0.0.5 or 6. And the protocol field, which is the thing in the IP packet that says what is the uh, what kind of uh, data is encapsulated in this packet, is protocol number 89. 
And then encapsulated in that is the packet header, which tells us uh, what type code is this. There's five different types of packet types. So a hello packet is what they use to make sure they can still hear their neighbor. The database description is used when uh, they send their, their topology information jigsaw puzzle piece to the other routers. And then link state requests and updates are used if they need more specific information. And the link state acknowledgement is kind of like, remember TCP? Or we did sync, sync, ack, ack, positive acknowledgement and retransmission. Every time you divide up a, a Microsoft update and it goes over TCP, he sends a chunk of it and then the TCP sends back an acknowledgement that he got segment one, send me segment two. So OSPF has a link state acknowledgement that's used when sending certain larger amounts of data. Okay, so hello packet, discover the neighbors, build adjacencies between them. Anytime two OSPF routers come up, they're gonna send out hello packets trying to find their neighbors and link up with them. The database to a Christian file is the, this, this, this database of all the network status, kind of like when you look show IP route, you see all the networks. Router A is gonna share all that with router P. Routing protocol's job is to, I call it routing by rumor. Their job is to share the networks they know about, their directly connected networks with all their neighboring routers so that everybody can ping any place and send any data anywhere within the network. If more specific information is needed, the type three and type four link state requests and link state updates are sent. And the number five acknowledgement is the acknowledgement for this. So here's a hello packet, top one packet. Uh, anytime a router comes up and you configure it to be OSPF, he's gonna immediately start sending out hello packets out all of his interfaces that are, you configured to be participating in OSPF and look for neighbors. So he's going to advertise. And now, before two routers can become adjacent with each other, they have to agree upon certain things. They have to agree they're on the same subnet. They have to agree to the OSPF area, or they won't become neighbors. We're going to look at it a little bit later about multi-access networks. Um, no, no more serial stuff. No more frame relay in the in curriculum anymore. So we, we're going to be pretty much Ethernet for everything. So Ethernet is a multi-access network, which means that you can attach a bunch of things to an Ethernet switch and they can all hear each other. So um, later on, we're gonna look at this problem. If we flood this data from all the routers to each other, if we have two or three, it's no big problem. If we have 10 or 20 or 300, it would be too much traffic. So we're gonna establish as a sort of a traffic prop, a designated router and all jigsaw puzzle pieces will be sent to him. And then he will send out the jigsaw puzzle pieces to all the other routers instead of a bunch of thousands of peer-to-peer -peer connections. It's such an important job that a backup designated router will be established as well. Okay, oh, this is all jumbled up here. This looks like a chat message or something like this. So let's go to the next one here. Okay, let's look at neighbor establishment. Uh, before the routers can, can send their jigsaw puzzle piece, we got three routers here. Okay, we got the one here. It's showing, oh, the thing is not showing. Okay, I can't see the echo of my ghost here, of my, of my, of my uh, mouse. So the router that's at the bottom left-hand corner, R1, the router at the top at the 12 o'clock position, R2, and the router down at the bottom right-hand portion, R3, are gonna establish connections with each other. They're gonna send out hello packets. Each router has got a specific, unique router ID, a 32-bit value. We'll talk about how that's determined later. So they're going to send these hello packets out to discover who their neighbors are. Well, R1 has got two neighbors. He's got R2 at the top and he's got R3 over at the right. Each of these routers has got two neighbors. So they're going to send the hello packets out and discover who their neighbors are because they need to find who their neighbors are before they can share topology information. So when a router receives a hello packet, he hears there's another OSPF router that is a, you know, thinking like him. That's the adjacency. The two routers are going to become adjacent with each other. They're going to establish a neighborship with each other. And then they're going to go through a process where they exchange their jigsaw puzzle pieces of their each topology of the network with each other. For example, router R1 on the left-hand corner, bottom corner, he knows about three directly connected networks. He's got an Ethernet port. And he's got two serial ports. And those are automatically in his routing table because, as you know, with Cisco routers, uh, uh, directly connected interfaces that are up and up automatically appear in the routing table. He's going to eventually share that jigsaw puzzle piece of his Ethernet port and his two serial ports to all the other routers. 
But before they do that, we're going to have to go through the process of determining uh, you know, master and slave routers or, or uh, designated routers and backup designated routers. After this process of sharing all the jigsaw puzzle pieces together with all the other routers, each of these three routers will have this complete map we see here in their memory. And then they're going to go through a process of distilling this information down to what should be put in the routing table. Okay, for two routers to establish an adjacency, they must agree on the hello interval. This is how often uh, hello packets are sent out. The dead interval, this is the interval after which that time expires, they lose their adjacencies, like if the point to point T1 line, zero point went down here. And they have to agree upon the network type. And also, they have to be configured to be on the same IP subnet so that they can ping each other. We have to have ping connectivity. So by default, these hello packets are sent out every 10 seconds on multi-access, like Ethernet, point-to-point -point segments, like these serial segments. Um, now, non-broadcast multi-access, which is not frame relay, uh, that's no longer in the curriculum. These are typically slow relinks, so they don't send them out so fast. They only send them out every 30 seconds. But we won't get to configure that. We don't have to worry about any, any OSPF stuff. So am I allowed to do that? Oh, good. Okay, the dead interval, by default, is four times the hello interval. So every 10 seconds, I'm going to send out hello. And every 10 seconds, I should expect to get a hello from you. R1 should expect to hear hellos from R2 and R3 every 10 seconds. If they don't hear anything for 20 seconds, and they don't hear anything for 30 seconds, they begin to get worried. And if they don't hear anything in 40 seconds, they're going to declare that adjacency dead. Oh, that jagged lightning bolt red link between the two locations went down or something. Someone cut a wire. Number one enemy of, of WAN connections, backhoe. Some backhoe dug up a line, killed the connection. So after 40 seconds, I'm going to lose that. And the, uh, the old frame relay stuff, he waited. Weighted to four times the 30 seconds to 120 seconds. So if this dead interval expires and I fail to receive hellos for four times in a row, I'm going to remove that neighbor from my database. I'm going to tell all my neighbors I still can talk to that I lost that connection. And then we're going to have to go through the process of trying to establish a backup path. Well, look here. If the path between R1 and R2 on this graphic made, there's a still a backup path. It's more latency. You can send the information to R2 instead of direct connection from R1 to R2. R1 can send it to R3, and R3 will relay it to R2. So we have some redundancy here. We have some fault tolerance. OK, if it's a multi-access network, because it would be too much flooding of information after the neighbors establish an adjacency with each other, they proceed to sharing their jigsaw puzzle pieces of their corners of the network. So the equivalent of what's my show IP interface brief? Show me your show IP interface brief so we can figure out what the network, whole network looks like. Uh, normally in a multi-access network, the OSPF will elect a designated router and a backup designated router. We'll see how that process works a little bit later. So the designated router is the one that receives all the updates. Instead of each router sending all his updates to all of the other routers, this is a big, you know, two to the power n minus two. This is a big number of peer-to-peer -peer connections. Instead, they all send their information to the designated router using that multicast address, 224.0.0.6. And the backup designated router is waiting in the background. If the designated router fails for more than one second, the backup designated router will take over, because otherwise the network information won't be accurate. So the DR receives all the updates from the other routers, and if there's any updates, from any one of these other routers, he updates all the other routers. He's the master communicator to all the other devices of all the updates. The VR, the backup designated router will take over if the DR fits. Okay, on point-to-point -point links like this, there's no designated router, backup designated router election. It only takes place in Ethernet. Well, we're not going to have any point-to-point -point serial connections anymore in Cisco, so it's going to all be Ethernet connections. So on all our labs, there will be a designated router. When I do the walkthrough for the lab there, we'll see that. So we'll change it to a multi-access network later on. So link state updates are used to uh, uh, send these jigsaw puzzle pieces of, of what the topology of the network looks like to all the other routers. And uh, this is more of CCMP stuff. We should have to worry about this stuff. OK, now, after the link state database has been shared between all the routers, number one, number two, 
each rather independently finds his position in the topology and calculates the, the most optimum path to every other point in the network using this cost uh, 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 thing of which is actually bandwidth. Uh, the cost metric is cost. The cost is uh, uh, bandwidth gets bigger. You know, uh, 10 gig is a bigger number than 56 kilobit. So we have to put it in the bottom of the fraction. So as the number gets bigger, the fraction gets smaller because the definition of a metric is the lower the number is, the more desirable. So each router will go through the shortest path first algorithm. Thank you, Al Gore, for inventing algorithms. And then we'll proceed to number three. Each router will independently find the best path to every other point in the network. That's called the shortest path first tree. And then those results are installed in the routing table. And that takes about a minute. And then you can show IP route, and you can see the routing table and see the O entries representing the OSPF remote networks that this particular router has learned about. Now, the concept of administrative distances, um, so my grandson is a Boy Scout. So you know the Boy Scout is most trustworthy, reliable, all these other things. This is the trustworthiness and reliability of a routing protocol. So RIP is a really older routing protocol. Uh, Cisco gives them an administrative distance of 120. Now, like metrics, the lower the number, the better. Um, Cisco's EIGRP is their own proprietary protocol. They give that administrative distance of 90. That's even better than OSPF. So if we were running a network and we were running two routing protocols at the same time, which is kind of uncommon, we're, say we're running RIP and OSPF at the same time. And a router receives an update from a RIP router and he receives an update from an OSPF router. Which one of these updates should he use to put in his routing table? Well, he's going to use OSPF because his administrative distance is a lower number. It's more better. So this is trustworthiness, reliability, preference of the routing source. It's very unusual to run more than one routing protocol. Maybe if you're a company and you buy another company and they use a different routing protocol before you get them you know, assimilated like the Borg into your network, uh, uh, you may run a few, but you're gonna eventually go to one single routing protocol. If you're Cisco, you're probably running EIGRP because that's their protocol. Um, EIGRP and OSPF are the two most popularly used industrial strength routing protocols in the world today. We can configure authentication. So if we have to worry about, you know, uh, some figures suggest that 75% of all security violations are own damn employees. So let's say someone is taking a Cisco Academy course and they think they're really hot snot, and they're gonna come in and bring some router they bought off of eBay and plug it into the company network and try to hose our real official uh, routers with some bogus information. Well, we can put a stop to that we can put password authentication on the routers. We can use authentication and uh, encryption and nobody else can just uh, in the help desk cube land area can plug in some device and mess the rest of our network. So we can do that if we need to do that. We won't be doing that in the lab, but that's an option. Okay, let's look at basic OSPF configuration of these three routers. Here we have the, each router's got three interfaces. It's got an ethernet port, it's got two serial ports, IP address scheme is that uh, it come up with. So this is a discontiguous network scheme, uh, which means that some of the subnets are sort of split. The old RIP version one uh, summarization was enabled by default, and that could cause a problem. We'd have to turn off automatic summarization. Uh, EIGRP summarization is now off by default. It used to be on. OSPF is classless, so we're going to include the subnet mask. And the summarization in OSPF is uh, uh, you have to sum summarize manually. He won't try to summarize it for you. Uh, summarization was an attempt to reduce the size of the routing tables. Back in the 1995, we started getting so many places on the internet that the routing tables mm -hmm. of the backbone of the internet had you know, three quarters of a million routes on them. So here is our basic command to turn on the OSPF command, OSPF stuff. So we're gonna to go to the global configuration mode and say router OSPF and put a number. This is a totally arbitrary number. It doesn't have to be the same on all the other routers, but I'm superstitious. I'm gonna just say router OSPF one on all of them. The config, the, the prompt then changes to config dash router and we're gonna tell it whatever networks we're gonna to need to attach and so forth. So it's a 16 bit number, any number between one and 65,535 chosen by the network administrator, locally significant only, doesn't have to match, but for consistency purposes, let's just use one for all of them. There's another number that has to match, the area number. We haven't gotten to that yet. 
Here it is now. So now we're at the config-router prompt and we're gonna put in the network command. We're gonna put the word network, revit it to net if I want, and put the network address, that's the address of, the, of that interface, zero port or ethernet port, we're gonna put the network address of that. And instead of the subnet mask, we're gonna put the wildcard mask equivalent, which is a mirror image. So 255.255.255.0, the mirror image is 0.0.0.255. So any interfaces in that router that match that network address will be used to send and receive OSPF packets. Now I'm gonna show you a cheat. I don't know if it works in Packet Tracer or not. Do you guys remember when we did the default routes? The command was IP route 0.0.0.0, .0, .0 space 0.0.0.0, .0 space 0000 X interface. So 0.0.0.0 in networking is like a wildcard. It's like if I go to a computer and I type delete star dot star, star dot star is a wildcard that says that means delete all the files. Uh, star dot star means delete all the files. I don't care how they're spelled. Star dot star matches everything. 0.0.0.0 in networking matches all IP addresses. So my Gonzo Secret Insider tip with OSPF is if you want all the interfaces to be uh, uh, participate in the OSPF process on a single router, just say network 0.0.0.0. .0, .0, .0. Wildcard mask 0.0.0.0. .0. And then area zero. And the CCNA, now we all are single area, area zero only. No, multi, no more multi-area OSPF, no more IPv6 OSPF that's been moved up to CCNP. But when we do the lab, they're going to give you the actual syntax to do that properly. So here's a little formula for taking a subnet mask and converting it to a wildcard mask. It works it backwards as well. So here we have a subnet mask of 255.255.255.240. Sounds like our skills exam from the first fundamentals class. It's a network that has 16 addresses, but uh, you only get 14 because the first address, the zero address is the network address. The last address is the, is the broadcast address. So when you subtract that from all 255s, you get 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.15. If you have a wildcard mask, you want to convert it back to the subnet mask, you do the same subtraction the other way, you'll get your original uh, uh, subnet mask as well. Now, some versions of the iOS will tolerate you typing in the actual subnet mask instead of the wildcard mask, and he'll gussy it up for you, as we say in East Texas. He'll gussy that up for you, like Microsoft gussies up bad web pages when you're in Microsoft Explorer. Internet Explorer, and they'll fix it for you. I've heard that the newer ones don't tolerate that. We'll try that on ours in the lab Thursday and see what happens. Okay, so the area ID in OSPF, uh, there always has to, you always have to start with area zero. So in CCNA now, it's single area OSPF only. You will only have one area, it will always be area zero. Area zero must be first. And you can add other areas in any order you want to. So in the textbooks, they always have area zero and oh, ha, 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 yuck, 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 area 51, the flying saucer area. But we're just going to have area zero in this class. So this is a feature in OSPF, a scalability feature, that if you have multiple areas, you can, uh, this, this uh, feature in OSPF that he uh, blasts all his, his corner of the jigsaw puzzle piece out the other routers, that's within his one area only. So we don't have to, uh, uh, it allows us to summarize networks and reduce traffic in an entire corporate network that might handle thousands of locations. So all OSPF routers in the same area, which we will all, our routers will always be in the same area, area zero, will all have the same link state information in their link state databases. Now here's an example of a multi-area. So area zero, that's probably, if uh, uh, Tarrant County College area zero is Trinity River, that's where our data center is. And area one, well, South Campus, we're number one. Area two, maybe that's Northeast Campus. Area three, maybe that's the Northwest Campus. Area four, maybe the Arlington Southeast Campus. You don't have to do them in order. You can do them anything you want to. However, you must start with area zero. And this allows us to reduce instabilities that may occur in the network. Like in this case, area 51 has had an instability. And all the routers are having to rerun the shortest path first algorithm. But it doesn't affect any of the routers back at the home office at area zero or the West Branch office at area one. So this makes the network more stable and reduces the map amount of overhead traffic that routing protocols use. So if you have a big area, we can use summarization and route aggregation and the whole, the whole idea here, anything we can do to reduce the size of the number of lines in the routing tables 
is going to improve the performance of our network because every time a pack a router receives a packet, he's got to look through his entire routing table. Even though we do things with parent and child routes to try to you know make it faster, every packet he's got to look at an entire routing table and find the one best match, the most bits that match, and deliver that packet that way. So we're going to try to reduce that by lowering the number of lines in the routing table. That's the secret of fast network design. So here's our network command, R1. He has the network 172.16.1.16, and he has those point-to-point -point networks. Those are the 255.255.255.252. So they became the wildcard mask of 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0.3. You could have said network 0000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, one line only on each of these three routers, and it would have worked just as well. But this is the official method of doing it. Uh, uh, you should know how uh, how to put in the wildcard mask equivalent of the subnet mask. So at this point, after about a minute, you'll see some messages on your screen. I've got a full adjacency with my neighbor routers, and you should be able to ping any of these interfaces from any other point on the network. Now, the router ID. Every router has to have a router ID. We need to uniquely identify each router with a unique router ID, which is a 32-bit value like an IP address. It can be derived from an IP address. So there's a couple ways of determining this. OK, the highest active IP address. If there are no loopback ports and there is no router ID command configured and no, no priority command has been configured, that will become a OSPF router ID for that for that particular router. That's bad practice. Number three is bad practice because real IP addresses can go down and down. If it's maybe a serial port or a connection to a remote WAN location, it could go down. The phone company could go down. That's not stable. So the best practice used to be number two. Configure a loopback interface, a loopback port on the router. Loopback ports are born up and up, and they never go down. You could type no, you could type shutdown and shut them down if you want to, but they'll never go down on their own because they're they're like the 127.001 in your desktop PC. They never go down. That used to be the recommended method. Uh, in the past 10 years or so, they've switched to the number one. Let's manually configure the router ID itself. And by the way, if you ever take CCMP advanced routing and do OSPF for IP version 6, you are required to create, number one, a router ID, a 32-bit ID. You have to do it OSPF only. You don't have to worry about that, though. So the priority is, if the router ID exists, that is the router ID for the for the uh, router. We'll do it at the config-router prompt. If no router ID is configured and any loopback interfaces exist, he chooses the highest one. If no loopback interfaces are configured, bad, bad practice. The highest IP address that happens to be up and up at that minute will become the router ID for that. So let's see. Uh, looking at our topology, we have not configured any loopback ports, and we have not configured the router ID command. What is going to be the OSPF ID for each one of these routers? It's going to be the highest IP address that was present on any one of those routers. So this is shown in yellow on your print. Each router chose its individual highest IP address, and that became a router ID and they're unique so this works that's just bad practice we can look at the we can show we can do a show command show IP protocols and they'll tell us the router ID and matches the highest IP address on each one of those routers so let's use it let's start by using a loopback port loopback ports can't fail they stay up and up forever no physical wire coming unplugged or telephone company line going bad can possibly mess it up so we're going to create a virtual interface with a slash 32 subnet mask. It's automatically up and up. They never go down. I can even ping them to test the connection to the router. I can route them as if they were actual attached networks. We use them a lot in Cisco Network and Lab Academy Labs. Uh, so instead of real networks, we can bring up a fake network as a loopback network and test it by pinging it. So let's create a, a loopback port on each one of these three devices. 10.1.1.1 on the first router, 10.222 on the second router, 10.333 on the third router, and use that host. Uh, it's a host value because the subnet mask is, means it only has one value. It's not an entire network. It's a slash 32. So we'll create those on each one of these three routers. 
<coughs> and that would be that way of doing it. Uh, the, the, the currently recommended method is to manually specify it. Go say router OSPF1, then use the command from the counter config dash router prompt, router ID and that number you want it to be. Uh, so this, if this exists, it takes precedence over loopback and physical interfaces. And uh, because we were told for so many years to use loopback ports, when you go out into the field and work on Cisco routers, you'll oftentimes see OSPF routers still using the loopback ports. If they've been configured more recently, they'll probably be configured with the router ID command instead. We can change the router ID if we want to. However, we have to, well, we could do a copy run start and reload the whole machine. That takes three minutes. We can go to the prompt and say clear IP OSPF process and we can change it in that fashion. And they'll go through the entire process of establishing their neighborhood, neighborships, and sending their jigsaw puzzle pieces to each other, and electing the designated router, and so forth. OK, what's going to happen if we accidentally configure the same router ID? This is going to blow the mind of the routing function. So if they're on two neighboring routers, they might not be able to establish a neighborship with each other. Cisco displays an error message. Duplicate ID detected. It's kind of like Microsoft Windows when he detects there's another IP address on the network with the same IP address. He says, duplicate IP address detected. I'm taking my toys and going home. Well, he doesn't say that. But what he really means is he's going to disconnect from the network because duplicate IP addresses are, let's see now, my wife is Catholic. Is that a venial sin or a mortal sin? You are not allowed to have duplicate IP addresses. It messes up the network. So now in this case, uh, we're going to do the show IP protocols command on the three routers, and they have gone through the process of reloading the routers or doing the uh, resetting them. And now the router IDs are those uh, loopback ports that we set, uh, rather the router ID command that we set. Now here's a very good command, show IP OSPF neighbor. So router one has got two neighbors. Does this remind you of show CDP neighbors? It showed you the neighbor device and what his post name was and what ports were connected them together. Show IP OSPF neighbors shows us the neighboring routers that have established an adjacency. We want to be in the full state, which means that the routers are fully adjacent. They have identical link state databases. They have calculated the topology and each one is individually put the right numbers in his routing table. The uh, dead time is the time uh, after which uh, they'll say declare their neighbors dead. And that should always be you know, higher than 30 seconds. The neighbor's IP address, the neighbor's IP address is the IP address interface used to form the adjacency with the neighbor. Okay, an adjacency may not be performed, may not form if something is wrong. The subnet masks don't match. Well, if that doesn't work, I can't even ping the other guy. How can I make him move? Uh, here are their hello packets. The OSPF hello and dead timers must match. By default, only thing that that's 10 seconds every hello, every 10 seconds. And after 40 seconds, uh, my neighbor must be dead. The network types do not match. So in other words, you can't plug a serial port to anything. If the OSPF network command was not properly configured, they are only uh, they only do what you tell them to, not what you uh, met them to. Uh, you'll have to fix that so it's uh, proper. So we can type show IP protocols, show IP OSPF, that last command, that's a great command, show IP OSPF interface. Unlike show IP OSPF neighbor, which only shows you the full states of your neighbors, show IP OSPF interface will show you the full state or the two-way state of your own device. It's a very, very powerful command. Now let's look at our routing table, show IP route. We have some Cs, directly connected networks. In our newer routers, we have the, also have the uh, uh, L for the, the link, uh, link, link local address, the actual IP address. So we have three directly connected networks in this routing table, and then we have the numbers in, so that uh, they look pink to me, with the O prefix. That is a, not a directly connected neighbor to R1. That's a remote neighbor that he learned through the OSPF process. So look at that first O line. It says 192.168.10.8. And then in the brackets, there's a number. What's that first number, the 110? That's the administrative distance of OSPF. Next number is the metric, the cost. That's a cost that's been reduced to a number. The lower the number, the faster the connection. 128, oh, that's the two hops to the other neighbor. The second pink line, the administrative distance is 172.16.1.32 slash 29. 
the administrative distance remains for a 110 for OSPF. And this cost is 65. That's a more desirable route if you need to go to that network. So look at the routing table and you'll see all your loopback ports if you configure those. Now, RIP version 2 and the older EIGRP is automatically summarized in an attempt to keep the number of lines and routing tables lower. OSPF does not automatically summarize, so you'll have to manually summarize with it. So here's the OSPF metric. So we have to put the speed in the bottom of the fraction. Otherwise, a bigger bandwidth becomes a bigger number. And wait a minute, metric lower is better. I don't want lower speed. I want higher speed. So we're going to put the, the metric, we're going to put the, the, the bandwidth in the bottom of the fraction. And it will become a lower number. So fast Ethernet becomes 1. Standard Ethernet becomes 10. Dial up 56 kilobit modems becomes 1,700. And this way, the router can choose the actually the fastest device, the fastest bandwidth links in this information. So this is called cost. The RFC just says, uh, configurable by the administrator. The lower the cost, the more likely the interface is used to forward data traffic. So Cisco has chosen the means, say that means inverse bandwidth. So the faster the bandwidth, the lower the cost, the more desirable the path, the fastest bandwidth will be picked. Cumulative bandwidths of the outgoing interfaces from the router to the destination network. So you can add up all the costs. Oh, this is just like, can you remember another protocol that's like this? Oh, yeah, we had it last eight weeks. Spanning tree protocol, which uses the shortest path first algorithm, which adds up the cumulative bandwidths from any point to other point to determine which one of my Ethernet links should I turn on and which one should I place in the standby state. A very similar mechanism. So OSPF accumulates the cost between all the links. We'll add them up. So this is why we have 65 and that red at the bottom, 64 plus 1. From router 1 to router 2, he went through the 64 cost and the 1 cost for the fast Ethernet. So he'll choose the best. If he went the other way, it would have been 64 plus 64 plus 1. That would have been a higher number. He wouldn't choose that path. OK, I'm going to skip the stuff about bandwidth on serial interfaces because we're not using them much anymore. Run into serial uh, interfaces in the field. Come back and check these slides. If you want to modify the cost of the link, you can do so. You can manually specify the bandwidth. Um, normally, we don't want to do this because the OSPF is pretty good at finding the one best by itself. But if you need to do that, you can do that. Uh, sometimes we have to use this manual modifying the cost if we're having a mixed router, a mixed multi-vendor environment. Now, again, most companies are going to use all Cisco routers and all Cisco switches. But maybe you buy another company and they don't have Cisco routers. They have Lucent or Nortel or Ascend or, or some other brand of router. You might need to use this cost command as a workaround to get them communicating with each other. Uh, we shouldn't have to worry about that for the CCNA test. Okay, here's the same chart about the OSPF cost. Now, let's look at this problem about multi-access networks. So here is more like what we're going to do with our labs. We're not going to use serial ports. We're going to use Ethernet ports. So here are some routers connected together. We have three routers connected together with some host machines and Ethernet switches. And multi-access means that that router on the right, R1, sends out a hello. Who hears that hello? Everybody hears it. It's multi-access. Everybody can hear the same thing. The workstations will pay no attention to it because they're not routers. But the router at the bottom and the router left will eventually use it, that to start communicating with router R1. So multi-access broadcast is just a fancy term for Ethernet. A single device can send a single frame and everybody hears it. It's flooded to everybody else on the network. As opposed, as opposed to build serial ports at the bottom, point-to-point -point links. So uh, broadcast is like a party line in the country. Everybody hears everything. Point-to-point -point network is like a personal telephone call. Only the two people on the call hear it. No one else hears it. So we're only concerned with point-to-point -point and broadcast multi-access. So we're going to use point-to-point -point in the current curriculum, but only between Ethernet devices. Broadcast multi-access devices will be like in that first earlier frame where a bunch of devices can hear each other. No more frame release serial ports. No more virtual links. That's the topic of CCMP now. We're not going to have to worry about that. So here's the problem. 
we have a bunch of OSPF routers that have just been turned on and they need to find all the other OSPF routers and they need to establish relationships with them adjacencies by hello packets and then they need to send their topological databases to each other, their roadmaps of their jigsaw puzzle piece of the corner of the network. So if we had multiple adjacencies, one for every power of, of them, we'd have, like here's, here's the formula, n to the n minus one to the uh, power two, that's a big number. If I have five routers, there's only 10 adjacencies. If I have 100 routers in a company, that's four, almost 5,000 adjacencies. That's overwhelming traffic, we can't have that. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to establish one of these routers to be the master router, a traffic cop, and he's going to receive and, and send all information back and forth. So that would be an excessive number of link state advertisements if we allowed all these to take place. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to take one router and we're going to wave our magic wand and somehow decide he's going to be the designated router. Now, there's actually a method for that. We'll see what that is in a second. So the designated router will receive all the jigsaw puzzle pieces of each one of these routers, a network topology, so that the equivalent of the human is show, show me your show IP interface brief command. And then the designated router will send that to all the others instead of this uh, multiple thousand went to point peer-to-peer -peer links. So on multi-access networks, like what we're gonna study, routers connected together with ethernet, and ethernet's a multi-access network. The designated router will be elected and a backup designated router will also be elected as, you know, kind of like the vice president. In case the president dies, the vice president takes over. The designated router takes, uh, that stops working, the uh, backup designated router takes over. All other routers become DR others or druthers. Gosh, if I had my druthers, I'd rather be the designated router, but I didn't have the right IP address, so I'm just going to become a druther. So in this case, R1, R5, and R4 in green, they're, they're druthers. You do a show IP. Uh, 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 show IP, uh, 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 show OFCF IP neighbor, you see the Druthers and you see the DRs and the BDRs. So Druthers only form full adjacencies with the DR and the BDR. Instead of sending it to all the other routers, they only send it to the DR and, and for backup purposes to the backup one, with these multicast address 224.0.0.6 that I mentioned earlier. So only the designated and backup designated router are listening for all these link state advertisements with their little the contents of which are each little router's corner of the network is topology diagram. So they both receive them and only the DR sends them. The backup designated router won't send anything unless the DR fails. So the designated router at the top in red, R2, he will send the information back to all the others. Only one router floods all the LSAs instead of all these routers flooding them every other possible connection. This cleans up and speeds up this process and lowers the, the amount of all this traffic flooded on the network as all these routers come up and try to figure out who am I and where am I supposed to be. Uh, doesn't happen in point-to-point -point network, in serial networks. We don't have to worry about that, those serial networks. So here are topology here where we have routers connected together, and they have uh, uh, been configured with loopback ports. A loopback port, highest loopback port will become the router ID in this case. So which one of these has been going to become the designated router? Here's the rule. The router with the highest OSPF interface priority. Oh, no fair. We haven't talked about OSPF interface priority. Uh, and the backup designated router will be the router with the second highest OSPF interface priority. If all interface priorities are the same, by default, they're always the same. Number three highest router ID will be used to break the tie. How do you get your router ID? Well, these days you manually configure it. Or you, 10 years ago, you would configure a loopback port. The loopback port would become the router ID. If we had no designation of the router ID by, by hand and we have no loopback port, it becomes whatever the highest IP address, physical IP address on that router happens to be. Bad practice, we should never do that. So what is the result of the election here? Well, the router that had the address 192.168, uh, the loopback port 192.68.31.33, that was the highest numeric value of any one of these loopback ports. He became the designated router, the one at the 3 o'clock position, router C. Router B at 12 o'clock position, he had the second highest loopback port value. He became the backup designated router. What does router A do? He's a druther. He's just a participant. He's not a boss. 
Now when we type show IP OSPF neighbor, we can see each neighbor, each router can see his two neighbors and what state they are. Router one can see, router one, remember router one was a druther. He can see one of his neighbors is a designated router and one of his neighbors is a backup designated router. So we didn't mess around with interface priority, so loopback loop back address will be used. We use the default interface priority. So the druthers only form full adjacencies with the DR and the backup designated router and backup designated router. They still keep listening for low packets, so they're aware of all routers that are in the network. Okay, so interface priority. Uh, if you want, this is an alternative method. I can go to the interface ports on these routers and manually designate an interface priority, uh, default one. I can change that to higher number. It'll become more desirable to become the designated router or backup designated router. I can make it zero. It can never become a designated router. Like other elections, this one can be rigged. So, you know, this is like, uh, what did Stalin say? You do the voting and we'll do the counting. Stalin was the guy in Russia 100 years ago. So you can force the outcome. Remember when we had spanning tree protocol? And it was an accident of the bridges switches MAC address when it would become the the uh, the uh, uh, boss switch. Uh, we can do we can change that with a, a command in spanning tree protocol and make our powerful fifty thousand dollar switch be the root bridge and not some other access switch that costs five hundred dollars and gets overwhelmed by the job. So in this case, if we set the priority to one for router C. And we set the priority of 100 for router B, and we set the priority for 200 for router uh, A on the left. We can the well the, uh, the the priority 100 should be the highest value. He should become the designated router. Uh, the next highest value was 100 for router B. He'll become the backup designated router. So if router A was our most powerful router and had you know it was a big chassis router, we will want him to be the designated router. This is making him do extra work. Similarly. If you have work, uh, host PCs, Windows PCs, you don't want a desktop student PC to be a primary domain controller for the entire junior college. You would put a, a big rack mount server to do that, and you would force it to become the designated, the back of uh, the uh, primary domain controller, a backup domain controller. Okay, so let's see. Here's the big picture for network design, guys. We're going to use some sort of interior routing protocol within our company maybe even just static routing, but probably we're going to use RIP or OSPF or EHRP within our company to give the connectivity to our, our company networks, and those will appear in our company routing tables, just a, a few dozen entries maybe. But we need access to the 750,000 or million backbone routes that are present on the internet. So on that router R1, which has a link to an internet service provider, we don't want those million backbone routes at the internet in our little $1,000 branch office routers. They don't have the capability for it. So we're going to go to R1, and we're going to establish a default route that says if anybody is attached to R1 sees a network address, tries to connect to network addresses not within the company, it would normally be dropped. Remember that default route command, IP route 0 .0 .0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
And the next stop, IP address, which is the IP address of our internet service provider, that 201.16.34.5. Now we're going to go into the OSPF configuration and say default information originate, which means take that default route line in orange and make it magically appear on all of the other routers in my company. So I just type two lines on one router instead of having to type one line on 300 routers. So when we look at our RAR1 router, this is what it looks like when you create a static default route. Gateway of last resort has been set. A star, the orange line at the bottom, 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0. This means that this router encounters any addresses that are within our company network, all those lines in white, it's just routed within the company. If it's a you know an external address like Google or Facebook or something, um, it won't match the interior interior address. It will it will it will not be a match and it should be dropped. But no, we've established a default route, a gateway of last resort, and that will send it to ISP and he'll deliver it for us. His million dollar we're essentially renting a little bit of processing power on that million dollar router that's at our internet server. Okay, that takes care of R1. What about R2 and R3? Look at R3. OSPF propagated this default route. We distributed this default route to R3 and R2. And instead of saying S star, it says O star E2. That's a type two, external type two OSPF route. It's the same 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. How do I get there? And he gives it the next hop address to get back to the R1, the home router for the company. So everybody in the company now, no matter which one of these three routers are connected to, has access to the internet. Are you typing in two or three lines of code on one device? That's the end of that. Okay. Okay. Now hang loose a second, guys. I'm going to uh, uh, do a little packet tracer. Let's see, I need to go to myself. Um, hold on, I got to check attendance. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. Now hold on. I gotta give myself permissions on the Windows machine. No, 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 no. This one. Uh, make a presenter. There we go. Okay, I'm now a presenter, and I'm gonna go and I'm gonna pull up the. Uh, let's see. Share. Application. Application window. Um, Packet tracer or share? Is it share? Will it share? Okay, it's shared. Okay. Oh, I should show uh, the topology. Wait a minute. Let me let me stop sharing this a second. Let's uh, share this the first page of that lab so we can see what the topology is. I'm going to share share an application application, and that's going to be the uh, lab. So this is a lab that we're going to do on Thursday, or you're going to do a packet tracer and send to me an email. Uh, I'm going to go in packet tracer now. In this lab, S1 and S2 are just pass-through switches. There's no he has you, you go through the lab and do passwords on them and so forth. There's no VLANs. Uh, for brevity, simplicity purposes, right now, I'm going to just connect R1 to R2 directly, and we'll still be able to show how OSPF works. So I'm going to connect R1 to R2 and Packet Tracer, and I'm going to skip the switches. I'm going to replace the switches with a straight line with an Ethernet cable. Okay, so I stop sharing this. And I will reshare the Packet Tracer again. So Packet Tracer is visible. Okay, so I'm going to go through and pull a couple of routers, and I'm going to use the routers that, like we have in the classroom, the 1941 routers. Put them over here, put them over here. Can they be seen? A little bit of latency there, a little bit of drag. Okay, so what I like to do is go to the first router. Oh, are we still booting? Okay. Okay, now I need to make a connection between. Now in the lab, they had you go and connect a couple of switches in between. I'm simply going to take an Ethernet cable and run it from, uh, was it G? I forget it was G001. I'm going to use 00, the core, the core one. There we go. Now, let me see. Can I make this text a little bit bigger so we don't wrap so much? Okay, it looks like a, in the packet tracer, they're actually a ratio. You don't have to worry about the lab guy having a ratio router before you. So I'll go into the privilege exec mode and go to the global configuration mode. 
and give them a host name of R1. And now I'm going to go to that interface, uh, gigabit zero slash zero, and do a no shutdown. And now I'm going to go to router, uh, the second router and do the same thing. Do my little test that I like to do to make sure they're actually connected with each other. So go to the privilege exec mode, go to the global configuration mode, and give the host name of R2. And then interface, you give it the zero slash zero. Let's shut down. So if that worked properly, my little test that I like to do, particularly in the physical lab, to make sure the wires didn't get messed up, is uh, do a show CDP neighbor. And so we can see here, let me expand this out a little bit. This mine's grabbing. So R1 can see, R2 can see that his neighbor is R1. And it's connected from G00 to G00. OK, that's good. You go to router 1, show CDP neighbors. R1 sees R2. So we got a good connection here. OK. Now let's do some uh, uh, configuration between R1 and R2 uh, with real IP addresses and make sure they can ping each other. So I'll go to R1 and go to the configuration mode and say interface gigabit uh, 0 slash 0. An IP address. Um, I'll just use it was one that was 10 dot something in the lab. I'm going to do 1.1.1.1. Dot, 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 dot. Point to point address. Conservation, conservation of IP addresses. I did a no shutdown already. And now let's make a loopback port. Interface loopback one. And make him an IP address. Uh, I think in the lab it was like 172.16.1.1. Host address. Now, remember, if you do a show IP interface brief, I never did the shutdown command. I never did the no shutdown command on that loopback port, but it's already up and up because loopback ports are born up and up. I can shut them down if I want to, but they're born up and up. So later on, that loopback port should become the router ID for our router R1 when we do the OSPF configuration. <clears throat> Let's see now. Stop this. So I'm going to go to R1. Let's establish a IP connectivity and ping and prove that the two routers can actually talk to each other. So let's show IP. Interface uh, brief. I don't think I gave an IP address to this. This went up and up, but I didn't give an IP address. So configure terminal. Interface gigabit zero slash zero. An IP address 1.1.2. I already did the no shutdown. So if we show IP interface brief, we can see it's 1.1.1.2. Now, the problem with the show IP interface brief is you can't see the subnet mask. You can just see the address. So I like the command show prot, which shows you the IP address and the subnet mask slash number all in one command. Pretty, pretty convenient little command. They don't emphasize it much in the labs, but I like it. Okay, should I be able to ping the 1.1.1? And it worked. The first dot was our resolution. I'll do it again, it would be fine. Okay, let's establish a loopback port. On this interface, look back one, and let's make him an IP address of uh, 192.168.1.1. Don't have to do a shutdown command. Well, let's do show protocol here. Let me see. Yeah, we've got our loop back is up and up. Didn't have to tap no shutdown. All right. What's in this guy's routing table? Show IP route. Directly connected interfaces. He's got the 1.1.1.2. And he's got the, the 192.168.1.1. He has no knowledge of the loopback. I, I, I can ping the 1.1.1.1. <clears throat> but I can't ping the 172.16. Shouldn't be able to. Can't ping 172.16.1.1 because in my routing table, there's no knowledge of how to get to the 172 network. Okay. We have no routing protocol here. We don't want to do static routes. Static routes are horrible. They're very difficult to work with, and, and, and they don't adapt to changes. 
So let's uh, introduce some OSPF information about these routers and see if we can get them to talk to each other. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to go to router, the first router. Every time I bring it up, he's small. I'm going to make him big. Okay, so show IP protocols. There are no protocols running. There's no RIP, there's no EIGRP, there's no OSPF. So let's put it in there. Okay, so I'll go to the configuration mode. Router OSPF one. And I'm gonna use the, let me see if this works in Packet Tracer. I'm not sure, we're gonna try that and see. Network 0 .0 .0, 0 0.0.0, 0 0.0, area zero. I don't know if this will work or not, we'll have to see. And I'll go to router two and do the same thing, see if this works. It works on really quickly. Let's see if it works on this fake macromedia flash simulation that's mostly like real routers. Configure terminal, router, OSPF. I'll use a different number just to prove that it doesn't make any difference. Network 000, zero, 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 zero area zero. Show IP protocols. It's running. Show IP OSPF neighbor. Doesn't see anything yet. It might not work in Packet Twister. I might have to actually do it. Sometimes it takes a minute. Let's see. Show IP route. Nothing here. I bet you it doesn't work in Packet Twister. Okay, I'm going to go back and change it and make it work properly. So I'm going to go. If you if you make a mistake in configuring a routing protocol the quick and dirty way, I said router. OSPF2, just tear it out. It's gone now. Now I'll say router OSPF2, and I'll say network, uh, what was it, 1.0.0.0. It was a 1.1.0.0.0.0.3. Oops, there it is here. And then the other network for my R2 was network. Uh, 192.168.1.1.0.0.0. There is zero. Show IP protocols. Okay. Now let's go back to R1 and fix them and see if that fixes the problem. Now if it doesn't work, we can blame packet tracer. Okay, configure terminal, no router OSPF1, router OSPF1, <clears throat> uh, network, it was uh, 1.1.1.0, 0.0.0.3, wasn't it? Zero. And network um, 172.6, He, he blew me away here. Okay, network 172.16.1.1.0.0.0.1. Notice that message we got there. We got the loading to full. Show IP OS PF neighbor. I can see my neighbor. I can see that my neighbor is the DR. So I must be the BDR. How do I do that? Show IP OSPF interface. And which interface am I going to use? How about gigabit 0 slash 2? So it tells me that I am, I'm the backup person in router. Good, that's working. Now let's show IP route. Okay, see my neighbor now. Is it possible that I can possibly ping that 192.168.1.1 down here? <coughs> oh, it works. Okay, let's go to router two now and see if we have connectivity there as well. Show IP OSPF neighbor. I can see that I uh, uh, my neighbor is the BDR. I must be the BR. I must be the designated router. If I show IP OSPF interface big zero slash zero. Yeah, I'm the des I'm the uh, doesn't it router? That's me. Show the routing table. 
I can see the other networks. I should be able to ping anywhere in the network. Now, how about, how about that far 172.16.1.1? I can ping. So now we have good connectivity here. We do show uh, IP protocols. We can see we know about all the other networks. So that's working fine. Okay, good deal. So that's essentially what you're going to do with the few more show commands when you do the lab Thursday. With the actual IP addresses he has there, I think he's just 10.53 instead of 1.1.1. And uh, 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 he's going to have you do some other show commands to uh, go through and mess with the which is the designated router and which is the backup designated router. Okay, let's see now. I'm looking for any questions. I don't see anything here. Um, Okay, guys, uh, that's another one for uh, put it in the books. And I'm going to hang loose here for a couple of seconds if there's any chat questions or anything, or you can email if you have any issues about this. And uh, you guys that want to come in on Thursday, I'll see you on Thursday. And then we'll meet again next Tuesday and we'll cover another chapter. Okay, I'm going to mute and see if there's anything going on. Oh, let me stop the recording, finish the recording.